And we welcome you back to Fox Soul's Black Report, your daily source of news, views, and opinions. Many political experts agree that President Biden's State of the Union speech last night was a test run for his expected 2024 presidential announcement. That's right, Courtney. David Litt, senior speechwriter for former President Obama, said that Biden deserved a solid A on his speech, telling sources that the State of the Union was for the moderate and independent voters, uh, the ones who delivered a big win for Democrats in November. He also pointed out the politically savvy, the political savvy of Biden when he used live TV to put congressional Republicans on the spot. They've now <laughs> pledged not to cut Medicare or Social Security, giving the White House the upper hand in any debt ceiling hostage situation. Rob Knoll, former speechwriter to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, gave Biden a C plus, saying the speech was flush with familiar platitudes, you know, bottom up and middle out, uh, pay your fair share and lacked a strong sense of voice. Uh, what did you think? You know, first of all, I stayed up through the whole speech. Mo most times State of the Union just get a little lengthy and like the latter of uh, critics said, you know, a little boring and you sort of kind of tune out a little bit. I stayed toe to toe with Biden. And I remember, you know, during one of our after uh, show speeches, I said, come on with it, B. You got to come with it, Biden. And I honestly believe he came with it. And uh, I, I just didn't like uh, some of the, the, the off decorum uh, from the opposite side. Let's let's agree to disagree, but let's um, let's stay polite uh, and politically correct, if you will. So I thought that was a little tasteless. What is it, Marjorie? I Marjorie thought, Taylor Greene representing Marjorie a, Taylor Yeah, Green. I thought she was a little tasteless, but uh, I, I thought he, he drove home all his points. Um, I think his guests were very poignant and those points that he drove home by way of those guests being physically uh, in the chamber. And and I'd give him an A as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, he definitely reminded us that uh, uh, we have uh, more to go. We have a longer road to go. Mm -hmm. We have to finish the job on a, a whole lot of different fronts. But, you know, President Biden, he brought his receipts. He did. You know, he did. And, and he said, I ain't been wrong. sitting around just That's walking right. around the Oval Office. You know, we've been we've been getting to work. And, you know, I always think back to the, the darkest days of the mm -hmm. pandemic mm -hmm. compared to where we are at, where, where mm -hmm. we are today. Look mm -hmm. at how physically close we are mm -hmm. compared to, you know, um, maybe a year, year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And so and he also says, it does stop, feel like we're trending in the right stop direction. Stop questioning my mental and physical well-being. He, he, he was sharp last night. Yeah. He said, stop with that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and it was really great to see the parents of Tyree Nichols mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so many of our fellow Americans sort of recognized in the First Lady's yeah. box. And so the, I think the, the optics and the substance were there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we won't be the judge of that. I think we have a special guest uh, that's going to dig in a little bit more. Indeed. We'll have uh, someone here who uh, tells us firsthand their grade of the president's speech and why uh, that is so. Speechwriter Michael Franklin, welcome so much to uh, the show. We appreciate you taking some time out for us today. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. And Michael is the co-founder and executive director of Speechwriters of Color. And so, Michael, tell us, uh, you know, your overall impression of President Biden's uh, State of the Union address. How would you grade the speech in style mm -hmm. and substance? So I'm a little tougher, but I would say it was a solid A minus from President Biden. Okay. First, okay. because of style, he really had some key values that he articulated in the speech. He really focused on the fact that we need to have dignity, progress, resilience, and fairness in our policies and our systems. And in terms of style, I thought he really hit it out the park because he was ready to clap back mm -hmm. against some of the retorts <laughs> and the heckling, but he made sure that he got his message out at the end of the day. That was especially clear and prescient for the moment we're living in. Yeah, well, you know, back in the day, an, an A was an A, whether it's A plus, an A or A minus, but so I, 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 I feel you on that one. So some some experts, you know, give uh, the president uh, speech yesterday, they, they give it this whole, it was for the moderates, it was uh, for primarily for the independent voters, uh, who, of course, we know delivered big wins for Democrats back in November. Uh, we, we know black voters played a major role in delivering these big wins for Dems. So which black voters uh, do you think the speech uh, was aimed at specifically? And, and, and did he hit that mark with, with this particular address last night? And so I think it was for all black voters, not mm -hmm. just moderate 
black voters because I mean calling out big oil and big pharma that's not aiming towards moderates leaning into the mic and saying that the tax code is not fair for everyone isn't leaning towards moderates but it's leaning towards fairness and it's leaning towards black folks who are teachers who are paying more in taxes than billionaires you know and I think that he did a really good job articulating some of the everyday needs that impacts black communities the most whether it's affordable health care and capping the price of insulin at thirty five dollars mm-hmm. whether it's being able to make a call for a billionaire tax and ensuring that folks are paying their fair share and even if it's talking about expanding medicaid coverage too like these are policies that impact black families and black communities and i don't think that's a message that solely resonates with moderates but i think it's those pocket but pocket book issues that impact black folks because the cost of food the cost of energy you name it those things matter to us and those hit our pocketbooks hard Hey, Michael, on the issue of police reform, the president said that every cop and every child has the right to go home safely. He also referenced the talk that black parents have been having with black kids for generations. What was the president trying to accomplish and was he convincing? I thought it was a really good moment in the speech. I thought it was convincing and showing that he's taken the time to listen to advisors that are black and to understand, try to provide him context with an experience that he personally hasn't had to do with his kids. And I thought it was especially poignant when he talked about how he doesn't have that anxiety and that anxiousness when his kids would go and get in the car and drive every day. But that's something that black and brown families experience. I thought as well that it was really good that he made the point of focusing on community violence prevention investment too, Mm -hmm. rather than just saying there needs to be more funding for police departments and local police departments across the country, but saying that we need to fund other sources that might be able to help decrease these terrible things that are happening to black folks from law enforcement agencies. Yeah, Michael, we have about a minute left, but before we let you go, please tell us about your organization uh, speech writers of color and how you are changing business as usual in, in, in this particular speech writing world. Absolutely. So speech writers of color is a global pr- organization that's trying to diversify the profession of speech writing because for too long and too often it's been gate kept and doesn't look like the audiences that folks are delivering speeches for. Hmm. And so with hmm. speech writers of color, we're building a community and an institution to advocate for communications professionals who want to get into the field, because whether it's writing for folks in government, politics, entertainment, corporate CEOs, you name it, once you learn about speech writing, you realize that everybody and their mama has a speech writer. <laughs> and it's right. Hard for us to get into. And so just sharing job opportunities, professional development, you name it. You can learn more at speechwritersofcolor.com, but it's really amazing work and really bringing on amazing folks into the field. It is, I love it, who knew? That's what Fox Souls Black Report is all about. Who knew? We appreciate you, Michael, thanks for that. Well, our thanks to uh, Michael Franklin, the co-founder and executive director of Speechwriters of Color. Thanks for joining us again on Fox Souls Black Report. Come back again anytime. Hey, we appreciate y'all. Appreciate you. Indeed. All right, let's move on here. A farming couple say they are the target of online and in-person racial harassment. And with the help of the NAACP this week, one of them is being bailed out of jail. Courtney and Nicole Mallory own a ranch encompassing nearly 1,000 acres in eastern El Paso County. Uh, He first made headlines a few weeks ago when his story was published in an online news outlet. He and his wife claim, among other things, that they've been harassed and their property vandalized. The El Paso County Sheriff's Office won't talk on camera, but said in the first in the uh, past two years, rather, they've responded to more than 170 calls for service that involve the individuals in the article and that they'll release the legal documents and body camera video upon request. And what I find a little confusing about this particular story is that it's the husband who was bailed out. He was held overnight. I do believe the NAACP helped with the $6,000 uh, bond, but he was held uh, for stalking, chasing. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, he was held for stalking 
um, which I, felony stalking, which I don't quite understand, but what, what they are claiming as a couple is that they have been stalked, they have been chased, and, and actually like words like you know the N-word uh, have been spray painted on their property. So I don't quite understand how he ended up uh, in, in jail overnight on, on uh, stalking charges. Um, so obviously, like the police force indicated, there's a lot more to be said about this, uh, about this case. A bit confusing for me. Yeah, and it's really distressing to see that there were 170 mm -hmm. service calls mm -hmm. placed to law enforcement. Um, and, that there, and that there's on. a record of that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the level of harassment, uh, the consistency of that harassment is absolutely uh, alarming. I don't know a lot of uh, places that would place 170 service calls to law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, and somehow, some way, they end up in jail. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to keep our eye on that. Indeed. Uh, but moving on to the immigration front, where immigration advocates say that the U.S. government's new mobile app for migrants to apply for asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border is blocking many black people from being able to file their claims because of facial recognition bias in tech. Nonprofits that assist black asylum seekers are finding that the app CBP1 is failing to register many people with dark skin tones, effectively barring them from their right to request entry into the United States. People who have made their way to the Southwest border from Haiti and African countries in particular are falling victim to apparent algorithmic bias in the technology that the app relies on. A 2020 report by Harvard University called Facial Recognition Technology the least accurate identifier, especially among darker skinned women with whom the error rate is higher than 30%. I don't trust none of it. We've even talked about some stories where facial recognition has ended people up in, in, in jail, locked up. Uh, and it took days and weeks mm -hmm. for their names to be cleared. Um, look, I know technology is great, but, but when technology is for you, it's a wonderful thing. But when it's against you, uh, it is very difficult to you know, prove yourself otherwise. And so therefore, I don't know what they have to tweak with this technology. But right now, as far as facial rec rec uh, recognition and some of the stories, the fallout from that with the misidentification, I don't trust it. And, you know, a big part of the problem here is that the government really, they recently announced in early January that this new CBP app, this one mobile app, would be the only way that migrants uh, arriving at the border can apply for asylum and exemption from Title 42 restrictions. You heard President Biden mention uh, Title 42, how they intend to, to get rid of it uh, once they uh, declare the public health emergency related to COVID over in May. Um, and so this creates uh, quite a situation that is disproportionately impacting us. And I think the administration has to answer uh, as to why they continue to use an app uh, that is uh, committing algorithmic bias against darker skinned black folks uh, and really making it difficult for uh, Haitian folks and, and other darker skinned folks seeking asylum. Um, it's really making it difficult for them to be able to do that. And so I think the administration has to be held accountable for this. All righty, to uh, suburban Alabama now, kind of a follow up to a story we brought you a couple weeks ago. That community is rallying behind a black author after the school district rescinded an invitation to have him speak and read his books at local at, a, at local elementary schools during uh, Black History Month. Award winning children's book author Derek Barnes, you see him here, known for writing stories for and featuring black children will no longer be visiting three Hoover City Schools, a school system uh, just south of Birmingham, Alabama area. This week, sources say D. Fowler, the district superintendent, cited contract issues and a parent's concern regarding Barnes' social media posts. Now, the cancellation incited outrage from frustrated parents, teachers, and Hoover residents, some of whom canceled, uh, excuse me, channeled anger uh, into activism. Hundreds have come together to raise a portion of the 90, uh, $9,900 hundred dollars Barnes would have paid uh, for the event. That's what he have gotten uh, paid for the event. So we talked about um, his appearance being canceled. Now the community or those who want to see him come and share his message and his books are fighting uh, for him to uh, still come and be a part of this uh, Black History Month celebration in this particular community. Yeah, and this story is connected to a national story that we've talked uh, about at length here on Fox Hills Black Report, uh, and that is this 
concern, this omnipresent concern around censorship mm -hmm. and controversial book bans in some parts of the country, specifically targeting titles related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We particularly see Republican-led states like Florida and Georgia and Tennessee and Texas where they've pushed these statewide rules, making it easier for critics to remove titles that they dislike from school libraries, uh, making it easier for folks to disinvite uh, authors and speakers uh, like uh, the author that we're talking about here. I wonder how many folks, this is the grown folks here, have really read the book. And, and got into the movement and the message that he is trying to or is putting out there, because he's pretty successful putting out there. And then I find it very interesting that the young people want him there. Listen to the out of the mouth of babes, listen to the babes. This is what the young people want. And it's, it's appropriate inside of Black History Month. So, you know, there's that. There's nothing about affirming the lives of black people. It's nothing about making black lives matter in literature. Uh, that should come as any offense. There's nothing about mm -hmm. that uh, that has anything to do with indoctrinate, indoctrinization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it was James Brown that said, I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> and yep, I, yes, it, I think yes, that's it what was, they may be mad about. And it still is. Well, stay mad. All right, still ahead, there's uh, a new study detailing black Americans and their connection to religion. That's right, we'll tell you what more blacks are doing to showcase their faith. You're watching Fox Soul's Black Report.